and it's now 5 p.m. here in Vienna. So I'm gonna start with introducing myself a little bit to you guys. Um, let me share with you a photo of me or a photo collage that my dear friend Neo from Ignites have put together. So just a little bit about me before we get into the conversation with today's guest. Um, I am an igniter thanks to my experiences working in various organizing committees of multi-sport events in different functional areas. I was lately working mostly in accreditation and sport entry, so I consider that as my, as my expertise. <laughs> um, I am actually, I just actually recently moved sides from an organizing committee to an NOC and I'm currently working at the Austrian Olympic Committee in the Games Preparation Department. So I'm exploring a new territory in the sport event world and I'm very excited about this change. For those of you who are tuning in today for the first time, I just want to tell you a little bit about Ignite or what is a what is an igniter? So igniter is an event professional who has worked alongside with at least one of the four founders of Ignites and who share their desire to strive for affordable, sustainable and impactful sport events and organizations. I have met Neo, Ilva and Xuan Ming for the first time during my first ever experience working in an organizing committee of a multi-sport event, which was at the European Youth Olympic Festival in Austria in 2015. And I also met Gustavo uh, later on at the Youth Olympic Games in Lillehammer. As you can see on the photos on the screen, I used to be a synchronized skater, but I also competed internationally in athletics, uh, rope skipping, and in other sports nationally on a school, school sport level. Before we move on to today's guest, let me shortly explain to you what is this series about. So the Ignite showcases we are introducing incredible professionals from the sport and event industry. We hope that by sharing their stories, we are able to inspire others who consider a career in sport and to inspire them to follow their dreams and become passionate about their work. And we also introduce ourselves to, to each other to get to know each other better and network a little bit and get to know about uh, our experiences. So now that it's uh, already three minutes into our conversation, I think it's time to move on to our guest, to our special guest. I'm gonna also share a photo of him before I bring him into the show. This is Francesco Fiorini, who is currently an IF Relations Project Coordinator at the World Academy of Sport. I have known Francesco for five years now. We worked together at the YOF in Austria, at the European Games in Baku, and at the European Olympic Winter Games in Lillehammer. Around that time, in 2015, 2016, we were both trying to set a foot in the sport industry, and we were trying to gain experiences in as many different events and areas as possible. And since then, our careers have continued on separate paths, and a lot has happened in our professional life. In the past four years, Francesco has been part of many interesting projects, among others with the ENXO Youth and the World Drafting Federation. He was also a key member of a small team revitalizing the International School Sport, Sport Federation. And recently he moved to Switzerland to work with the World Academy of Sport. Francesco attributes his success to his people skills and also to his luck. So let's uh, talk to him and explore what is behind his achievements. Let me try to invite Francesco here <laughs> to us. Hello, Francesco. Welcome to the Ignite episode, uh, uh, showcases episode four. How are you today? Where are you tuning in from? Hi, Vicky. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to this showcase today. I am in uh, Switzerland, in Bern precisely, where I live now. And uh, yeah, I am well. To you. <laughs> good afternoon. And good afternoon to everybody that tuned in from all over the world. So 
yeah, everyone, if you have any questions to Francesco during the conversation, please feel free to ask them in the comment section and we will try to incorporate that into our conversation today with Francesco. So I'm going to start with my first very complicated question. <laughs> are you ready, Francesco? And are you guys ready? Let's see. <laughs> So Francesco, the most challenging job of your career up until now was at the International School Sport Federation. This organization, for those of the listeners who may not know, is responsible for many international school sport events, including World Championships. And the, uh, the biggest among all, I guess, is the Gymnasiade, which is a multi-sport event for high school students. In the past couple of years, the organization has gone through a major development and you were key part of this change. Please explain to us how did this big shift start and what was your role in it? Yeah. So first of all, the, the International School Sport Federation, ISF, is uh, basically the world governing body for school sport. Um, it, uh, it organizes, as you mentioned, schools, uh, world school championships, which are uh, unisport events for uh, school students all around the world and uh, some multi-sport events the most important of which is the uh, gymnasiate uh, which um, yeah it's a, it's a multi-sport event for kids between uh, 12 and 18 years old uh, in uh, about 18 sports depending on the on the edition so the the international school sport federation let's say until 2014 was um, was an organization that was mainly based in Europe though I mean it had about 60 members and was mainly active in Europe with a few members uh, from uh, from other continents and uh, well let's say that uh, it had already many events but its events were not well known outside of uh, of a quite restricted circle um, in 2014 basically one one main thing changed which is the, um, uh, the president of the federation changed and uh, Laurent Petrenka uh, French a French person who is still the president now of uh, the International School Federation got elected and well Mr. Petrinka is a person that has a great vision and he uh, imagined school sport as something more. He imagined school sport as, um, as a vehicle uh, to uh, transmit values and to, um, uh, yeah, and, to, and to bring sports to all of the corners of the world and uh, not just at the high level but at schools and to give possibilities to kids in schools to actually be part of a, of a greater network through its events but also through through the community so uh in 2014 the isf had very little resources and what mr petrinka did uh was to give um, let's say a lot of trust in uh, in a few young people and I was lucky enough to join the organization in 2016, right after my experience at the, at the Euro 2016, uh, the UEFA Euro. And uh, yeah, at that time, the organization missed a bit of uh, direction in the, uh, in the sport department. Uh, it had been developed uh, in, the, in the previous two years from the well, general administration point of view and uh, marketing and communication point of view that it missed on direction the sport department and that's why i was hired so i was hired in at the end of 2016 uh, actually i joined as an intern before uh, first and then i was hired with a with a full-time contract and my main mission there was uh, to um well, to uh, let's say put the uh, the ISF in the international sports map. So mainly to maintain or create relationships with international sports federations, and to um, 
to change together with my colleagues the the aspect and uh, the character of uh, of the events we were we were organizers in order to uh, give the possibility to, to as many kids as possible to take part in uh, in international uh, school sport events. So, Francesco, what would you say was the um, the changing moment or the year or the period when you know your work at the federation together with your few colleagues have actually started to really become a reality and then when you really started to see the shift from yeah. being something smaller um, more based mm -hmm. in europe rather and now it's actually a worldwide uh, organization mm -hmm. I, I would say that the the turning point at least from the the external point of view for from what you can see from outside was uh, 2018 2018 was a was a very key year for the organization uh, the first ever uh, major multi-sport event was organized in Africa and it was organized by the ISF, the Gymnasium. It was organized in uh, Morocco, uh, in the cities of uh, Marrakech and Casablanca. And uh, after the uh, after the Gymnasium, the, um, well, President Petrinka was re-elected for a second term ensuring that uh, the work he did and that he let us do in the first two years could be continued. Uh, talking about the gymnasium, the, the gymnasium in Morocco was something extraordinary. It was something, something extraordinary because of the, of the volume of, uh, of people that it uh, attracted, because uh, never before we had 3,000 kids uh, competing in a in a single school sport event, and uh, from the point of view of uh, of uh, communication and of uh, how the organization was per perceived outside uh, of the of the school sport world, well, it was the first time that we had uh, several representatives from International Sport Federation on the spot. We had the IOC on the spot, and um, and that of course gave great value and great credibility to uh, to the event and to the organization itself. And building from that moment, the organization was uh, was able to uh, to improve its governance even more, to create commissions, to improve, again, the relationship with international sport world. And uh, yeah, I really believe that from 2018 on, we can say that uh, the ISF has really been on the map of international of international sport. So you've been with ISF for about three years, is that correct? Yeah, three years exactly. Perfect. So um, during these years, which were, as I understand, very busy and quite hectic, you have been traveling a lot and you have been working with a lot of people, um, even high profile people, presidents and secretaries generals of organizations and you have uh, been having you have held meetings and you have been helping in organizing committees of uh, various events so during this period what would you say was your most valuable asset or useful skill which helped you to handle the amount of workload and cope with the high pressure that you have you may have experienced well i would say that uh three things were, the, let's say, the best assets. The first one is that, that I loved what I was doing. So having heavy workloads and working evenings, working weekends was not something that, uh, well, at least in the short term, uh, influenced me too much. So that's the first thing. And I believe that for everybody that works in the sports sector, that is a uh, kind of a must. You always need to know that you need to uh, to change your life pace and adapt it to either the, the organization or the event you're taking part in or you're working for. And if you don't do that, then it's very hard to to have a success in this in this world, in my opinion. The second asset I would say, and I I would take exactly what Andres uh, said uh, last week in uh, in his showcase is uh, is definitely languages. And you know, being able to speak a couple of languages is always 
uh, helping, especially when you go to countries that, uh, that are not used to international events or when you have to deal with uh, delegations that, uh, that come from parts of the world in which English is not uh, very widespread, it's always useful to manage to get yourself understood in, in different languages. And well, the last thing is, and I believe it's the most important, is actually the ability of, uh, well, let's say being nice to people, or let's call it people skills. But really what I found in, in those three, year, three years at the ISF is that uh, there are people that are really willing to get on board if you're showing them that you are a vision, that you have a vision, and that you are, you are willing to take them on board with you. So when, uh, when we were getting to, to events in the beginning at the ISF, and let's say these people were used to organize the events the old way without really um, receiving directives from the from the central office or from the central organization which made every event very different not consistent you know and you know it was very difficult for the organization to kind of keep track of everything that was happening because of this reason and when we came in uh, together with my colleagues we tried to give uh, well, to put some order in these events the problem is that the moment in which you put, you try to put order and you try to, to give these people instructions without letting them feel that they are part of the change and part of the, of the organization, that is the moment in which you begin to have problems. And I, I experienced that on my, yeah, on my own. The first event I went to, you know, I was like, all right, I'm, uh, I'm here. I'm the authority. I, come, I came from the Central Federation, from the International Federation. You have to do this, 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 and this. And uh, I realized after two days that if that was the way I was managing like the all of the events I was going to, I would have made a lot of enemies. So from that moment on, <laughs> from that moment on, I changed completely the way I was approaching people and uh, making them feel part of the project, compromising a lot because you always need to compromise. You will never manage to uh, to push something new from the beginning and uh, from A to Z. So in the beginning, you just need to, to try to push the things to, uh, that you believe they are the most important, like to draw a line uh, over which you know that you will never go. And, uh, and you need to know that until that line, you can compromise. So you can compromise about uh, maybe the number of people that, uh, that can fit in a room, and uh, even if uh, if uh, the rules say that uh, you can fit two, well, in this event we have four uh, four room people, uh, four people room. We will use four people room, and that will not um, will not change the character of uh, our event. We cannot compromise on having boys and girls together in a room. Like this is a very <laughs> simple yeah. example. So I think it's a key, it's a key word that you are now um, expressing compromise in the event uh, and the, well, in the sport event industry and uh, working together. Well, I worked from an organizing committee side with a, with a main host organization like ISF and, and it has uh, been always a very dynamic uh, relationship between the two. So. It, you have to definitely compromise because everyone has uh, different expectations and you have to kind of yeah. bring them together and manage them uh, in a way. So I think this is a key key message for those who work in this uh, industry to be able to compromise and work towards the same goal together. Um, building towards on what you have mentioned that uh, your, your people skills, you being able to kindly talk with all kinds of different people with all different uh, cultural backgrounds and try to understand them. Do you think your educational background, uh, having a bachelor's and master's degree in international relations and diplomacy has helped you in this in any way? Yeah, I mean, it definitely happened, uh, helped in, uh, in many ways. In the end, the reason why I, I chose to to work in sports was that I had that background in international relations. 
that uh, that kind of uh, helped me, let's say, putting myself on, um, let's say, uh, at, let's say to look at things from a different perspective and not, uh, you know, not to look at things just from uh, from one point of view. In general, what helped me from my background, I, I could say it's definitely languages because the fact of having studied international relations and having studied in different countries definitely helped me fine tune that, that aspect. And more than the, uh, the international relations itself is the, um, the kind of, uh, let's say, humanistic uh, education that I received in general, at high school in Italy, and then at university, uh, which is uh, which always tends to, uh, you know, understand the people or the culture or the environment you you um, you work in or you have to deal in to deal with, and um, the uh, well to be open to uh, to listen to listen to people and to know that uh, people may come from. Uh, very very different starting point than yours so i would say that that is what my background in international relations helped me the most in uh, in my work in sports so our next question is a bit of a scandalous one from mio <laughs> <laughs> in 2017 you were offered a position in her team in the youth olympic games organizing committee in buenos aires and well we now know that you have decided to stay with the isf uh, and not uh, make a move to argentina so i would be interested to understand how did you come to this de decision what were the major points that you took into account well you know that was a really really difficult decision i had to make and uh let's say that when neo first approached me with uh, with that offer i was a hundred percent sure that i would have accepted it i was still in the, in my first two or three months at the isf and uh, I was not sure if I was getting offered a full-time contract, so I was sure I would have I would have accepted that. However, then uh, talking with my with my colleagues at the ISF and uh, with the president of the ISF, well, it came up that they actually wanted to offer me a full-time position, and they wanted to to really give me this uh, this role of. Uh, of as I said, of putting the ISF on the on the map of the international of the international sport, and uh, I I had two or three very difficult weeks in which I really didn't know what to um, what to decide. In the end, the reason why I decided to to stay in Europe, where uh, where because it was a full time job, you know, and uh, when. Uh, I had I had tried to work in events before, and let's say I had not been the luckiest, uh, but uh, I had always found uh, positions uh, is either as a volunteer or as a well or as a whatever in position in organizing committees before. But you know it you know it very well. It's like it's three, four, five months. Buenos Aires would have been a bit longer, but still it. Uh, it was an adventure that had uh, that had a deadline, whereas at the ISF there was no no deadline. This is the first thing, and the second thing is that when they told me, you know, in the end you are going to be the one that is going to negotiate the the ISF position with all of the international federations, with all of the international sports organizations, and uh, they began to you know tell me, all right, you are going to represent the ISF at uh, the Sport Accord Convention, for example, or you are going to um, represent the ISF at the European Evening of Sport. You know, you, you look at the, the people that are in the guest lists of, uh, of, those, uh, of uh, those events, and you understand that you really have the possibility to, uh, to, to, uh, to talk to, to people that you didn't imagine you would talk to, at least at your age. And uh, you you actually have the the opportunity to make a real difference for a, for an organization. So that's uh, the reasons why I chose to stay at the at the ISF in the end. 
So actually, we have a question from the audience asking how many member countries does ISF has? Uh, at the moment, I mean, I left the organization in, uh, in the last month of September, so I, I'm not really aware of uh, the last developments. But when I left, it was about 120 countries, which is impressive if you think that when I joined in the end of 2016, we had about 70 members. So it's, uh, I mean, the number of members skyrocketed, and that was all thanks to, uh, well, to the work we did, and that especially a colleague of mine did in, um, in, uh, in managing to attract memberships and, and to showcase the, 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 the opportunities that people and students around the world can have through the ISF. Well, congratulations uh, for your successes with uh, ISF, uh, since uh, you have been working together with also many other organizations. Let's move on to speaking about your current job, which is at the World Academy of Sport. Uh, can you just tell us about a little bit what does this organization do and um, you know, uh, why did you make the decision to make to, to change and what is your current job actually? Yeah. All right. So let's let's speak about the decision to change, which is uh, very, very simple. Like the reason why I chose to to leave the ISF is because uh, I didn't feel at home in Belgium where the, the ISF is based. And, uh, you know, I was uh, traveling a lot and for me to, to go back to Brussels after long travels and not to, to have uh, that home feeling what began, began to become really, really heavy. I, I love the job I was doing, but I mean, as you can imagine, it was, uh, as, as we already said, it implied long hours, long travels. So when you have those two or three days of a break, you want to be with the people you love. You want to be with uh, in uh, in a place you love, and Belgium was not my place. I really couldn't make myself like that. And at one point, I really decided that I wanted to change. It, unfortunately, it it was impossible to change with the ISF because I would have uh, stayed at the ISF. If, if that would have been possible, I would have stayed, but that was not possible. So I decided to move on. I, I applied for a few jobs and I received this offer from the World Academy of Sport um, in yeah, last month of uh, September. And World Academy of Sport is, uh, if we want to, yeah, to take it from uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, company, the company vision, is uh, the, the World Sports Education Partner. So, uh, the, well, first of all, World Academy of Sport is, is not a, an organization, it's not a federation, it is a, a private company. And uh, it offers education and training solutions to sport organizations and sport events. So uh, just as, a, as an example, it is the company that uh, manages together with the, the IOC and the IPC, the Games Experience Program, which is what, uh, what once was the, uh, uh, the, the Observer Program that um, manages, uh, well, still together with the IOC, uh, knowledge management and transfer of knowledge. And uh, we have partnerships with uh, several international sports federations and we, yeah, we provide different, uh, different education solutions that, uh, that fit the needs of, uh, of international federations, which can be uh, people development or workforce development through the train the trainer methodology. It can be exact, executive education seminars on, uh, on different topics that can, can be general management, uh, strategic planning, uh, high performance and so on. And we have uh, an online platform uh, through which our uh, international federation partners can basically build their own online academy with, uh, with online courses that then can be used either uh, in combination with uh, the other methodologies or 
just as online courses. So, and my role in uh, in the company at the moment is uh, to uh, to follow the day-to-day -day relations with uh, with all our international federation partners, which is uh, about ten, and to um, yeah to do the basically the day-to-day -day management of uh, of the international federation academies together with our partners. Which of your current programs uh, that you are involved in do you think is the most, let's say, interesting or that you find the most attractive or exciting project to work on? Work let's on? say, I mean, I would say that it's the project I'm actually working on uh, these days. And uh, it's not my project. It's a project that was there long before uh, I joined the organization, uh, which is called uh, getting to snow sport it's a project that we have with the FIS Academy so um, this Academy is a joint venture between the, the International uh, Ski Federation and the World Academy of Sport and uh, getting to snow sport and especially getting to snow sport in China is uh, a project that aims at uh, reaching the Chinese government goal to bring around 300 million people on snow and ice by the Olympic Winter Games of uh, 2022. So our role in, uh, in this project is, um, is to make sure that uh, the, the people that are trained to deliver this project and that the, the delivery of, um, of courses uh, that are, are organized uh, during this project is uh, quality assured. Uh, basically, this project is uh, is uh, well. It's a it's a mass participation project. It in, it it aims at encouraging people to get into snow sports. So uh, the the final product is uh, a um, a getting to course that anybody can, uh, that goes to a Chinese ski resort can access to. Uh, a person that has never put skis or snowboard on in in their lives, they can have this three-hour course introduction to skiing, and uh, with the hope that then these people, through the resorts and through the help of the Chinese Ski Association and of all of the partners of the program, can actually stay in snow sports. And yeah, being part of that is uh, let's say challenging because the goal is uh, is very big. And at the same time, is really, really exciting because it it opens new horizons to me. It's things that I I haven't worked on before, and it's totally different dynamics, uh, totally different partnerships, and uh, yeah, really, it's very exciting. Well, I bet it is, and you know, uh, knowing you for the past five years and knowing how many projects and how many organizations you have been involved with, you are continuously uh, developing your skills and your knowledge, and uh, you are being involved in so many things that, uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't even know how you keep up with all this <laughs> information, and 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 uh, yeah, it's truly truly inspiring uh, your career path in general and actually um, Ilva had a question uh, related to this uh, um, and I also wanted to get into a little bit to your past before working in the sport industry before ISF um, around the time or before we even got uh, to know each other uh, because I know that you have been at the International Olympic Academy Youth Participant Session in 2014, and prior to that, you have been actually a, an athlete in Canus Lalom. You were coaching, and you actually have been also a rafting guide, uh, and you have been trying to get into this sport, sport world, sport industry for quite a long time. So tell us about your yeah, the beginning of your career, basically, a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, basically, yeah, I was uh, I was an athlete, if we can call it an athlete. I was I was never very good as an athlete. I never reached any any real uh, any real goal as an athlete. So I really loved sport, and that is why I in in the moment in which I decided that international relations was not going to be uh well that my career would have not been in in diplomacy and international relations 
I just uh, needed to to do something. So I I got some uh, coaching brevets and I began to coach at my local club in Verona, Italy. And at the same time, I I became a rafting guide, rafting and in general whitewater and well the river is very very close to to what I was doing as a kayaker. And uh, and it was uh, a bit of a way to get myself back in the sport world and to yeah to earn some uh, some little money which is uh, which is uh, never never bad. And let's say that entering the sport world was uh, definitely not easy. And I believe that. Every person that enters the sport world as a young person needs to take into account that, especially in the beginning, you will always be underpaid or not paid at all, and that you have to do a lot of volunteering and that uh, you need to do a lot of networking in order to, to get somewhere. So basically, before I got my first real job at, uh, in the sport world, which was, uh, well, the first real job was the, uh, the job I had at the uh, UEFA Euro 2016. I volunteered in plenty of events uh, with, uh, with uh, a, well, a very precise goal in mind every time I was going on an event, which was to, to network, 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 and again, network. So I, let's say I, I began to uh, to be quite bold <laughs> and to approach every person that I that I was seeing as a person that could uh, that could uh, help me uh, getting in uh, into the sport world uh, on all the events I was in, and that is what definitely helped me a lot. Uh, you mentioned the the International Olympic Academy, and yeah, well, definitely the. 2014 and the young participant sessions at the International Olympic Academy was, I think, the turning point of, uh, of anyway, my career in sport and the moment in which I really understood that I, I wanted to work in sport. I, I met some really, really ex uh, inspiring people. And, um, and uh, it is these people that bas basically pushed me into the world of sport. During this uh, young participant session, I was networking with my peers, exchanging ideas, and there was two. There were two people in, part, in particular that I that I have to thank. One of them was she pushed me into my one of the first uh, volunteering experiences that I had, which is where I also met uh, you, Vicky, as the EYOF in uh, in 2015. And the other person was uh, well. At, was at the time the uh, the secretary general of the of Enzo Youth. Enzo is the European non governmental sport organization that has a youth section, and uh, well, that was the person that actually pushed me into this network. And I would say that the event network and the European sport network are the two networks in which I dove myself in, and that helped me then. Uh, really building so many connections and so many links that little by little got me the opportunities the opportunities that i that i had later on i'm glad that you mentioned uh, the ENGSO short for european non-governmental sport organization uh, actually one of the ignites founders i'm not sure if um, if all our listeners or viewers actually uh, know this, but Ilva is an ex executive board member, board member of the ENGSO. And, but you have been working in uh, ENGSO youth projects. So tell us about what kind of projects you have been involved in, what, was, what were your tasks or your missions with this organization? Yep. Well, um, so yeah. First of all, I was, uh, as I said, I was involved in the in the youth section of, of Engso, which is uh, which is called Engso Engso Youth. And you know, in the beginning, I I couldn't really understand what was um, what was uh, the role of all of these projects. Uh, Engso Youth has project that uh, that. Uh, well, they are mainly European projects, and they they of course 
uh, count on the well, European Union resources and other European funds. But in the beginning, I couldn't really understand this, uh, this organization. I must you know, be very honest. I just saw that there were a lot of people uh, in, uh, that were in sports, that were working in sports, that were meeting at, this, uh, at these projects. I was like, wow, this is something I really need to be part on. So let's say that uh, when, I, when I got to know Wangzo, my main goal was to, to network. Uh, in the end, networking I really believe that Wangzo, sorry? Networking is key. Yeah, networking is the key of everything. Sure. Even though, uh, if you yeah. remember, Andres was saying that he knows that this is important, but he never felt inspired or never felt brave enough to to do so <laughs> yeah i think i think that we get yeah we can definitely talk about networking i mean networking is uh, i don't know as an advice the only advice that i can i can give to people that need to build a network is just to to be bold to make yourself interesting and to to have an interesting story to tell that can fit the the needs or what you believe the needs are of the people of the people you're talking to and uh, this is what I did at uh, every single sport events, every single uh, thing I was uh, invited or I managed to sneak into. And <laughs> I think that uh, that is what helped me a lot. But talking about Enzo, I really, I mean, Enzo Youth had many different projects, European projects that uh, uh, were about volunteering in sports, grassroots, um, inclusion, employability in sports uh, so there were different projects and that i was uh, that what i was part of uh the the nice thing about most of these projects is that you realize once you're in it that first of all you are you're carrying carrying on with this project with people that are actually like-minded which is always very very inspiring and that you can somehow make the difference at the local at, at the local level. You can somehow make the difference uh, in uh, in the lives of uh, of people that are that are, have the same objectives you have. And uh, and this is, I believe, what was m most valuable in my in my young so youth experience. Beside all of the friendship that then I created, because of course, when you're part of uh, of this project for a couple of years, you you travel around Europe, you you meet many people, you build friendships, you build the network, and uh, and you are yeah part of uh, of something that is actually very valuable. Well, thank you very much for sharing all your stories with us and all your experience. We have a couple of more minutes uh, to talk about one last question and a couple of people in the audience have been asking about this. So basically the question is, uh, what advice would you give to a young professional uh, who is in the beginning of their career or maybe they are already, you know, they have some experience, but they find themselves maybe in a situation where their rules and responsibilities are above what they are used to. It's a, their responsibilities might be outside of their comfort zone or over the level of their expertise. Maybe this is some, this is a situation you might have found yourself at ISF in the beginning. Yep. So what advice would you give to, to these people? With the well, I would, that you already have I would say uh, when you're, when you're given a task, never, believe that uh, you are the one that can that can uh, bring the task to its completion alone like when you're given this kind of tasks that are bigger than yourself you always need need to have uh, blind trust in the in the team you're part of and really especially when you realize that you do not have certain skills that are needed uh, one of the most useful things to do is to talk about that with the people you're working with and to and to in, to try to involve as many skills as possible in uh, in the project so that the the project can uh, can get to the end to be well to to work hard but that is pointless to say if you if you want to work in at a certain level you need to work hard and uh, yeah i would say to to be a really 
really bold to to trust your abilities and to 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 know your limits and uh, and to know that uh, that you might very well fail also you know it's uh, it's something that you always need to take into account and if you if you believe that uh, you will always succeed in every project you you begin then well that's the key not to succeed at all so uh, i believe that you need to trust yourself trust your team and uh, and just uh, go for it and uh, i think that this is the like boldness and and trust are the two things that uh, <laughs> that got me everywhere so i think that these are the two things that would get everywhere anybody Great. Well, thank you for the for the encouraging words, the the advice that you have given to us and to the, all the listeners. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is the end of our episode four of Ignite showcases. Thank you, Francesco, for being with us today. If there is any last words that you wish to share with the audience, uh, let me know. Let us know. Well, though the only word I want to share is uh, that I want to thank uh, Ignites a lot for for this opportunity to to talk with you, Vicky, and to to everybody that was listening today. And yeah, and of course, if uh, if anybody wants more information about the organizations we talked about, so uh, the ISF, World Rafting, Engzu, the World Academy of Sport, I mean you can easily find uh, my Facebook contacts or my LinkedIn. And uh, well, I'll be very happy to have talks with anybody about these things. So you guys, you heard him be bold at him on Facebook or LinkedIn. <laughs> his name is, wait, I'm going to put his name up on the screen so that you can easily find him. <laughs> yeah. All right. So thank you once again to everyone, to you, Francesco, uh, for Ignite, uh, to hosting and organizing this series and to everyone who joined us today. Um, well, Last words, goodbye, and see you at the next episode very soon. Tune in for that. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.